Is the new Omicron COVID variant about to take over the world? Here's what you need to know. Researchers in South Africa are tracking the rise of Omicron, a new COVID-19 variant of concern within the context of a large spike in cases in the South African province of Gauteng, 90% of which were from the new highly mutated variant, according to Deutsche Welle. The Guardian reports that scientists in South Africa and Botswana separately submitted discovery of the variant on November 23rd, and the journal Nature notes that many of the 30-plus mutations to the coronavirus spike protein that characterize it are linked to the ability to evade infection-blocking antibodies and heightened infectivity. Penny Moore, a virologist in Johannesburg, told Nature there are also hints the variant could dodge herd immunity conferred by T-cells, though Omicron's effect on vaccine efficacy and disease virulence is not yet clear. Richard Lessels, an infectious disease physician, said at a press briefing organized by South Africa's health department on November 25th that there is concern the variant may already be circulating widely in South Africa. Since it was sequenced, the variant has now also been discovered in Britain, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Denmark, Belgium, Israel, Australia, and Hong Kong, according to Reuters. Coronavirus strains are still evolving. Here's where the virus is at now and what happens next. SARS-CoV-2 will continue to evolve in various directions beyond the mutation seen in its Delta variant, according to Hamish McCallum, director at the Center for Planetary Health and Food Security at Griffith University. Since the virus's emergence in 2019, the global population of SARS-CoV-2 has accumulated an average of about one mutation every two weeks, according to the Next Strain COVID tracker. Writing for the conversation, McCallum explains that these mutations occur when the virus's genome, made up of around 30,000 nucleotides, is replicated and some of those nucleotides are erroneously replaced. Along the way, some of these mutations confer advantages on the virus, in particular, the ability to produce more cases more quickly, and these mutations are more likely to survive into the next generation because of natural selection. At the moment, the Delta variant offers a clear demonstration of this selective process in action. People infected with Delta carry 300 times more viral particles in their bodies than those with the original Wuhan strain of the virus when symptoms were first observed, according to a recent South Korean study cited by Reuters. On top of that, a smaller Chinese study, released as a preprint on July 23rd, found that while the original Wuhan strain was detectable in people's bodies six days after exposure, Delta was detectable after just four, which means it is replicating faster. In combination, this ability to replicate faster and replicate more often means Delta has evolved to be two to three times more transmissible than the original Wuhan strain, according to one evolutionary biologist cited by NPR. In practice, that's likely to be happening because the increase in viral particles inside the body has been linked to both an increase in the virus's ability to transmit in the open air and in its ability to transmit through fleeting contact, according to McCallum. While faster replication times can make contact tracing efforts more difficult, according to an article in the journal Nature. However, the evolutionary principles behind Delta's evolution so far are consistent with evolutionary theory, according to McCallum, and those same principles can tell us about the directions in which useful mutations might take the virus next. For instance, a number of recent studies, including one by the researchers at the University of Oxford and the UK Office for National Statistics, have found that vaccines are already less effective at preventing Delta infections, and that where infections do occur, the high viral loads found were similar to those in unvaccinated people. With viral particles that evade vaccines carrying an evolutionary advantage, evolutionary theory tells us that we can expect an arms race between vaccine developers and the virus, according to McCallum. Vaccines will attempt to catch up with viral evolution and, as a part of this, we're likely to need regular booster shots designed to overcome new variants, similar to flu booster shots. Alongside this, because the virus's increased ability to transmit relies partly on its ability to reproduce in large numbers inside a person, and that increase takes up more of a person's resources, it is also likely that anyone not vaccinated will be facing a virus that is more harmful to them because they will be facing viral loads much higher than they previously would have done. From there, propelled by the broad principles of evolutionary theory and acting through random mutation, the virus's ability to transmit will continue to increase, people will continue to become infectious sooner, and variants will continue to make vaccines less effective, at least until the virus reaches the point of peak fitness, where it runs out of advantageous mutations to develop. 
The virus cannot evolve indefinitely, according to an article published in the journal Nature Medicine, and eventually a virus will reach its form of maximum transmission, after which new variants will provide no further advantage in infectivity. However, this may not preclude more dramatic shifts in the virus over the longer term. The UK government's scientific advisory group for emergencies says it is a realistic possibility that the virus could combine different strains, or combine with other viruses in humans, or combine with viruses in animals, and this could cause more transformative mutations. Depending on the type of virus it combined with, this kind of mutation would cause increases in mortality rates and necessitate more substantial changes to vaccines. The only more optimistic note in that report from the UK government's scientific advisory group for emergencies is that it is a realistic possibility in the even longer term that the virus could become less virulent, like the common cold. In the conversation, McCallum explains that this makes sense in evolutionary terms because versions of the virus that make their host very sick are generally selected against. People who get very sick are more likely to die or be isolated, he says, which lowers the chance of the virus transmitting to others. All of these theories about where COVID-19's direction of travel remain relatively broad because there is a huge number of combinations of mutations that are possible, according to Stephen Goldstein, a virologist who studies the evolution of coronaviruses at the University of Utah, cited by Vox. There's so much complexity that is beyond our capacity to understand, he explains. However, two further predictions appear widely agreed upon. First, Kari Devink, a virologist who studies viral evolution at Bowie State University, explained to Fox that the virus isn't likely to drastically change how it transmits. At the moment, it's a respiratory virus, and it is likely to remain that way. If you consider a cold virus, you don't worry it's going to start to be sexually transmitted or anything, Devink says. Similarly, it likely won't become predominantly surface transmissible. Finally, it is certain that humans cannot catch up with the virus by evolving ourselves, according to McCallum in the conversation, because we do not evolve quickly enough. SARS-CoV-2 has experienced roughly the same amount of mutational evolutionary change during the pandemic proportional to its genome size as humans have since the Homo habilis first walked the Earth about 2.5 million years ago, according to Ed Feel, professor of microbial evolution at the Milner Center for Evolution, also writing for The Conversation. The antidepressant fluvoxamine, sold under the brand name Luvox, could reduce risk of severe COVID-19 symptoms by almost a third in high-risk patients, according to a new study in the Lancet Global Health Journal, which gave around 1,500 volunteers with COVID-19 100 milligrams of the drug twice a day for 10 days. According to one study author cited by CNN, the drug targets two dangerous immune responses prompted by COVID-19 infections, the production of inflammatory molecules called cytokines and the production of blood platelets, both of which account for some of the most serious COVID symptoms. Cytokines are small proteins produced by the body's immune cells after coronavirus infects the lungs, according to pharmaceutical company Insight. They bind to receptors on cells, signaling for those cells to adjust how they grow or behave in order to direct an immune response against a pathogen, including causing inflammation. The problem cytokines can cause is that as part of an immune response, they attract additional immune cells, which in turn produce additional cytokines. If too many cytokines are produced, they can overwhelm the body and create what is known as a cytokine storm, according to live science. Cytokine storms and COVID infections can cause excessive inflation, which damages lung cells, scar tissue can form that prevents oxygen from passing into the bloodstream, and weakened blood vessels can allow fluid to fill up lung cavities, which causes respiratory failure. Fluvoxamine may reduce its production of cytokines, according to one of the professors from the Lancet study cited by CNN, and it may also reduce levels of blood platelets. Blood platelets circulate within our blood, binding together when they recognize damaged blood vessels, and the U.S. National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute says COVID-19 infections make them more prone to forming potentially deadly blood clots. In the Lancet study, 741 volunteers with COVID-19 received fluvoxamine, while 756 volunteers got a placebo. Just 11% of those given fluvoxamine needed hospital treatment versus almost 16% given placebos. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.